Well, welcome once again here at Winter Park. If you're new with us, we have three other locations joining us, Oviedo and Sanford and Winter Springs. Winter Park, can we give it up for all the locations joining us? And welcome. Joining live right now via technology. Week two, week two of a series we're calling Rewritten. If you joined us last week, you know we talked about uh, a couple of guys in Second Chronicles, taking it way back to the Old Testament, Rehoboam. In Jeroboam, I went and found a different king today. I had to have somebody easier to pronounce, and so we'll get to him in just a moment. We're under this idea or this thought of rewritten, that there are some things that we've said, that we've done, that we wish that we could unsay, we could undo, we could rewrite. And we decided last week that if we will give Jesus the pen, that he can write our story, and he's a much better author than you. He's the smart kid in your college English comp class. Like, you have her or him write your papers. That's the God that we serve. They write a better paper than you. They write a better story than you. Anybody like me have some things that you've sent out that you wish that you could unsend? Only a few of us here at Winter Park. I guess we have a bunch of holy people here. Come on, Oviedo, a bunch of college kids at Oviedo. I know that you've posted some things. Hey, you're gonna regret that one day. Just so you know, you're gonna that job interview, that picture, I mean, what was happening here? You're like, I don't remember, and that's a problem as well. Come on, that's funny. We've sent posts, we've sent emails, we've sent texts to the wrong person. You ever talk trash about somebody to their face via text? Just like... It's just kind of a slip. You're thinking about them, but you're thinking about texting about them, and then you accidentally text them. You ever done that before? Nobody? Just me? It's a tough moment. It's a really tough moment. You're like, I hate them, and they're like, I am them. You're like, oh, I love you. I was just kidding. Just kidding. Sarcasm. Opposite day. You can tell I have a four-year-old and eight-year-old. I just don't know what opposite day is. Things that we've sent that we wish we could take back. Anybody else like me? I'm from Alabama. And so sometimes we don't talk so good. You know what I mean? Anybody else ever write something out exactly how you would say it? And then you read it out loud and you realize how bad your grammar is? Nobody, you're like, no, that sounds, that sounds awful. I talk like that? Yes, you do. It's the idea that we're sending these things, we're writing these things, we're posting these things. Hey, more importantly, we're living these things that we wish that we could undo, that we wish that we could rewrite. And we studied Rehoboam last week. Today we're gonna study a king Actually, a grandson of Rehoboam in 2 Chronicles 14, 15, and 16, talking about a king that, man, he lived a really good life, and we're gonna see here, he's a really good king overall, but he got to the end, and he, he made some mistakes, we're gonna talk about that in just a moment. His name is King Asa, A-S-A, and it's really important that you Google that or YouTube that, how to pronounce it, or it could be, don't say that out loud in church, like, that's really bad, A. Eh? Some of you are like, I never say that. Okay, fine, find a different church. You're perfect, we know. We don't cuss out loud at Action Church, just in our heads. <laughs> it's quiet here. Hey, Oviedo, Winter Spring, Sanford, you should visit sometime and teach all the new people how to respond. It is, just kidding. But seriously, like Asa, that's funny. It's just funny. Here's some themes here. Here's some themes that I wanna talk about and kind of build up before we get into the content this morning. The themes of these three chapters, 2 Chronicles 14, 15, and 16, we find King Asa at the beginning fully committed to God, but at the end of his life, we find him only partially committed to God, and we see the fruit of each. What we find is a theme, it's not just how you start that matters, it's how you finish as well. And in fact, this journey of Christianity, the start is important because salvation is important. It's the most important decision you'll ever make to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But, but we're trying to finish this race well as well. Trusting in God and not your abilities is what guarantees success. We're gonna find that in this passage today that when we trust in God, we succeed. But when we trust in ourselves, there's some things that we may need to be Rewritten. The last thing is we must be careful, get this, we must be careful not to take God's favor and blessings for granted in a season of growth. If I'm just honest with you today, when I study these three chapters, I, I find myself in King Asa. I find myself wanting to please God. We find him re, uh, reigning for 41 years, 35 years of which are peaceful, 35 years of which are are in prosperity, 35 years are trusting God, and the last six, he doesn't, 
He doesn't leave God, he doesn't forsake God. We'll find that out in just a moment, but he just goes from fully committed to only partially committed. Here's what I wanna compare real quick before we get in to the story. Verse nine of chapter 16 says, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Goes on to say here, what a fool you have been. From now on, you will be at war. From now on, you will have stress, anxiety. You will be fighting. You will be worrying. Go back one chapter, verse 17 of chapter 15. This is right after Asa has been trusting. And again, we'll go through the story in a moment. Just to give you these two pictures. Asa's heart remained completely faithful throughout his entire life. So what we're comparing here, we're not comparing somebody like Rehoboam last week who the scriptures tells us was an evil king. Asa remained faithful. He, he trusted God, but there was a certain point, 35 years into his reign, that he went from fully committed to partially committed. He had the right desires. He had the right heart to finish his race. He just made some poor decisions. He just relaxed a little bit. He just took it for granted a little bit and relied on what God had done as opposed to what he was doing. Reminds me one time uh, that I was sitting at Chick-fil-A right here in the Winter Park, Winter Springs area at Tuscaloosa, in between our two locations. I was sitting with my wife and her best friend, Kristen, and a couple other of our couple friends. And, and they were all talking about this feat that they had accomplished. These were committed individuals, right? They had a goal and they finished it. They were talking about the marathon that they had run. And if you know anything uh, about marathons, they're tough. It's 26.2 miles. You train usually for months, maybe even a year to prepare for these marathons. Well, I had these these six people all telling me about how amazing the marathon was and how challenging it was and the proverbial wall that they hit. But I reminded them that I was a competitive CrossFitter. <laughs> if you've never met a CrossFitter, you, you don't know that CrossFitters love talking about CrossFit. And they love talking about how good they are and what they did and what the wad was today. That's the workout of the day and how fast their time was. And and what we're known for is that we're training to be good at any sport, that you're prepared for the unexpected. And so I'm sitting here with these marathoners that are rubbing it in, and I'm saying, I, I can run a marathon. I'm a CrossFitter. We're ready for anything. They're like, no, you could never run a marathon. You'd have to train. CrossFitters don't uh, do good at cardio things. I was like, you don't know me. <laughs> what was your time? So we go around the table, time, time, time. They're all around four 25, 430, 440, and, and they'd all ran one or two marathons, and I was like, that's nothing. I'm gonna run a marathon. I'm gonna beat all of your times. I'm not even gonna train. So I signed up for the next one. It was in Nashville. My dad was gonna run with me. He was 59, 60 years old at the time. I said, Dad, let's lace them up. So I buy some shoes, Brooks, Apparently they're great with people with flat feet. I buy some running shorts, not the sh really short one kind because that's weird, guys. Get them down about mid-thigh. Let's all be serious. Just try to stay pure men and women. That's too short. It's too short. So I buy some shorts and I buy a little tank top, buy some running shoes, show up to Nashville, lace those bad boys up. No training. Running with my dad. We're, we're running. We got that person that paces you, that carries a sign that as the race goes on, you absolutely hate like, what do you do with your life to be able to run faster than me and hold a sign? <laughs> not many jobs or kids. You're not even moving your arms. <laughs> so we're following him, and he's getting further and further away. We need to run about a 9, 9.15 pace. So I run with my dad. Again, he's setting the pace. He's run several marathons. So, Dad, we got to beat four hours. We're not only going to beat their time, we're going to crush their time. And so we're about 9 miles in, 10 miles in. Dad gets this little, this little, uh, uh, Tinge in his hip, tweaks his hip flexor, slight, slight tear in his hip flexor. And so he's struggling for a little bit, maybe a mile, mile plus, and he keeps telling me that I should just leave him. But I feel like I'm in like this war movie, like No Man Left Behind. And so I like, <laughs> like the music's playing and it's building. It's like, Dad, I can't leave you. Like we have a goal to finish. He's like, No, go on, son, carry on the family name, finish the race that was set before you. And so there's this moment, this tear filled moment where he just begins to get further and further away. And Tears and heartfelt emotions, and slow, powerful music, lots of strings, and you get the picture. So we're a little bit behind this point because he had 
coming up with an injury, and so I gotta make up some time. So from mile nine to mile 19, I run a sub seven minute pace. I'm moving. Like I don't, I don't have any headphones because I was gonna run with my dad, we were gonna talk, so I'm just running by thousands. I mean thousands of people that have given their whole life to this feat of running, and I'm just like, suckers! <laughs> And you wasted some time. I bought these shoes last week. I have a huge blister. I've never worn these before. <laughs> Why are you going so slow? Walk through the water station at mile 19, get my water, get the goo, or whatever that stuff's called. Again, I'm not a runner. I don't even know. They started handing me fruits and gels, and I don't know if I do. I eat it or rub it under my arms. Like, do I stink? Like, I don't know what to do with. Come on, that was funny. So I throw the water down in the trash can. I go to run at mile 19 and a half or so, and I feel like I got shot in my calf. I've never been shot before, but that's what it felt like. And I start limping a little bit. Okay, I can push through that. A few more steps. I, my left calf, like there's like a, a gunman, like a sniper from the. So I'm, I'm, I'm dying. Then I get double quad. So then I'm just going. Then hamstrings start to cramp. I'm down. I am down on the sidewalks in Nashville for at least 15 or 20 minutes. I'm rolling around yelling, God, take me now. <laughs> Two elderly black women come out of their home and say, should we call 911? No, I'm fine. I got to beat my wife in this race, not like physically. I got to. <laughs> I get up. I'm not kidding. The last seven miles, church, seven miles, I I dabbled in this move right here. I fell at least 100 times. I had this one move I was really proud of. That I would just kind of throw my leg out in front, kind of release that hammy cramp, and then just track it down. Just This 90-year-old man shuffled by me at the end. Never been more embarrassed. He was at the end of his race in more ways than one. <laughs> it's a story. Relax. And he knows that he's 90. <laughs> I get to the end, and there's the finish line, and, and there's a picture that you could go online and buy for like $99 because they're just crushing you with those prices. But my stride is like right here. Like I am just shuffling. Two paramedics pick me up at the finish line, take me into the medical tent for an IV. Like they had me flagged like high risk. Here's where the story is, not the finish line, not in the IV. The story is the most embarrassing moment, getting pushed through the Nashville airport by my 60-year-old father with a torn hip flexor, getting a pre-board for Southwest to fly home. <laughs> I'm telling you all this. I had a desire, just like Asa. I had a faithfulness to, to finish, but I wasn't fully committed to the process. And I finished the race, and I'm here to tell you today that this rewritten journey, it's not all just a heaven or hell issue, although if you have not accepted Jesus, it 100% is. But a lot of us as Christians, we're gonna finish, but we're finishing just limping across the finish line because we begin to believe some wrong things, we begin to do some wrong things, to create some wrong habits, and I just wanna rewrite the end of our journey today and not be limping, but be in full stride running the race that God has for us. Let's study 2 Chronicles chapter 14. Let's start in verse one. Let's read verses one through seven. Let's study his journey. The first two things we're gonna study here with King Asa are gonna be things really we can follow, we can model, we should do these things. And the last one, he kind of goes off the rails a little bit. I think we'll learn from that as well. When Abijah died, he was buried in the city of David. Then his son Asa became the next king. There was peace in the land for 10 years. Asa did what was pleasing and good in the sight of the Lord his God. He removed the foreign altars and the pagan shrines. He smashed the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah poles. He commanded the people of Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and to obey his laws and his commands. Asa also removed pagan shrines as well as the incense altars from every one of Judah's towns. Asa's kingdom enjoyed a period of peace. During those peaceful years, he was able to build up the fortified towns throughout Judah. No one tried to make war against him at that time, for the Lord was giving him rest from his enemies. Asa told the people of Judah, get this, let us build towns, let us build something and fortify them with walls, towers, gates, and bars. The land is still ours because we sought the Lord our God, and he has given us peace on every side. How many of you would 
Make that a prayer request in your home, in your business, in your life, that you would just have peace on, on every side, seeking the Lord, receiving peace. So they went ahead with these projects and brought them to completion. So he destroyed the enemies of God. He destroyed the pagan shrines, and he built altars. He built fortification. He built cities to protect what God was doing. First thing I want you to write down if you're taking notes, if we're gonna really study this journey of, of King Asa, that he, what he would tell us today is be fully committed, be fully committed to build everything on God. Like everything. Everything that we do, church, should be built on God. Everything we do should be an overflow of our relationship with God. These first seven verses, we find them in prominence, but verse eight, an attack comes. And I wanna take a time out right here for a second and, and let you know there's some, there's some bad theology out there that if you're living for God, then you're never gonna go through anything tough. That's just not the Bible. In fact, Jesus speaks directly against it. He actually promises troubles. He promises attacks. Sometimes the worst attacks come when you're doing your best. You now I was running that marathon and, and there were some direct attacks. I saw a lot of runners, a lot of people that had trained they were in shape. They didn't have a CrossFit body. They had a running body. They, they, were, they, were, they were runners. They had on the real short shorts. I mean, they were runners. <laughs> and I saw them cramp, and I saw them in the medical tent. I saw my dad who had trained for over a year. I saw other people that had run that just pulled up with an attack. They pulled up with an, inner, uh, an injury. A, a muscle just ceased to function, and sometimes when you're running your race even well, fully committed, there will be a direct attack that will attempt to take you out. But church, you know I saw some indirect attacks as well. I was running, and I'm just honest, I was struggling. Like I was riding that struggle bus hard. <laughs> Not funny. <laughs> 945, winter, winter spring's laughing. Love you, miss you. <laughs> I was running, and here's what I heard. Heard some chirping from the sidelines. Had a guy over there drinking a, a slushy, making fun of me. He had mustard on his shirt from the hot dog he had just woofed down. He's over there making fun of me. Sir, you're outside the ropes. What have you done with your life? Nothing. I may not be good with the guy with the sign, but at least I'm in the race. Sometimes the attack are gonna come from critics from the sidelines. I heard last week, we actually had a lady tell our ushers here, we had, we had two young men here at our Winter Park location that were sitting in a, one of our services the whole time and criticizing and heckling our church the whole time they were sitting here. Talk about an indirect attack. Talk about, talk about a waste of time. Like, why are you here? Two Christians. Just talking about don't do this and why are they doing that and this and that and this and that. Just eating their hot dog. Mustard on their shirt. Looking ridiculous, judging people that are actually doing their best to run their race. Can I just let you know that when you decide to go all in at this church thing, when you decide to go all in at this Jesus thing, there are gonna be people on the sidelines, maybe family members, maybe friends, who say, why are you giving? Why are you serving? Why are you showing up early? Why are you going on missions? People in our country need Jesus. Yeah, they do, but people overseas go into the ends of the earth. It's all there, and people will criticize. Can we be a church that doesn't criticize the way other people do it, but we create a place, we create a place for people to find Jesus. I found it ironic studying this week because it really got under my skin for a second, but I found it ironic that Jesus didn't have a lot of time for Pharisees and religious leaders because they had it all figured out. He had time for sinners and the least of these and for unschooled ordinary men and women that he said, hey, come along and follow me and we'll change the world. You wanna find a perfect church that you, you can't criticize because they get it all right? That's not action. You wanna find a church that's gonna create a place for lost people to find Jesus and for found people to work through their stuff? It's right here right here. And I just believe that we're going to have attacks, both direct and indirect, and we got to be prepared for them. Here's what happens here. Here's what Asa did. I think we can learn from this. Let's keep reading together. 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 8. King Asa had an army of 300,000 warriors from the tribe of Judah, armed with large shields and spears. He also had an army of 280,000 warriors from the tribe of Benjamin, armed with small shields and bows. Both armies were composed of well-trained fighting men. They were prepared. They, they had it together. That's important because Asa had them prepared. They were doing the right things. They were fully committed. But once an attack comes, an Ethiopian named Zerah attacked Judah with an army of one million men. I'm not a mathematician, but that's more than 580,000. 
like a lot more, like about 42% more-ish, give or take, round the one. The advanced on the town of Marisha, so Asa deployed his armies of battle in the valley north of Marisha. Then Asa cried out to the Lord his God. He had an army prepared. He did everything that he could, but he came up against an attack, up against an enemy that he could not defeat. So what did he do? He didn't strategize. He didn't send out some troops. He didn't try and flank them. He said, God, I was prepared, but I wasn't prepared for this. He cried out to God. Oh, Lord, no one but you can help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, oh, Lord, our God, for we trust in you alone. I love what Asa's doing here. He's reminding God of how big he is. Man, he's a salesman, right? God, nobody like you. Nobody mighty like you. Hey, middle school and high schoolers, go to your parents. Dad, nobody generous like you. Nobody gives to your kids freely like you do, oh, Father of honor and glory. He's reminding God, I think it's a good way to pray. Hey, God, I read it today at 2 Chronicles 14 that they cried out to a mighty God and you showed up. I'm crying out to you right now in my situation, in my attack, reminding God, putting our faith in his faithfulness, but reminding him a little bit, God, you can, I know you can do it. I know you can do it. Help us, O Lord, our God, for we trust in you alone. It is in your name that we've come against this vast horde. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere men prevail against you. So the Lord defeated the Ethiopians in the presence of Asa and the army of Judah, and the enemy fled. They were destroyed by the Lord and his army. So they played a part. You need to get that today, that God's gonna fight for you when you cry out, but there was still a well-prepared army that fought and defeated them. They carried off a vast amount of plunder. They took what the enemy was using for bad, and they brought it into the house of God. Here's what I wanna bring out, go a little deeper here. This Zerah from Ethiopia and the battle was at Marisha. I want to talk about these names for a second and kind of bring them to life for how they can weave in and out of our journey as well. The enemy, Zera, attacks constantly. You have an enemy that attacks constantly. But especially when you're following God in a season of peace and growth. And he'll attack you where he can do the greatest damage, Marisha. If you trust in your own strength, the size of your army, regardless of how big and well-trained it is, the enemy will always present a problem that is stronger and bigger than you and your abilities. So it guarantees you failure. Therefore, we cannot be partially committed to God. We gotta be fully committed to building everything on him. Here's what Zerah represents. Zerah, to shine like a light. From the root word meaning to appear like a symptom of leprosy. The implication is that the outward appearance seems good, but ultimately it brings death and destruction. I need you to know that when Zerah attacks, when the enemy attacks you and your family, and the secret sin in your life, and the mistakes and the insecurity, he comes in, the Bible says it's an angel of light. This Zera looks great. It looks like it's magnificent, but yet it's dying. It's rotting on the inside. A counterfeit wouldn't be a good counterfeit if it didn't appear real. That's how the enemy attacks. He comes in looking like light, looking like it's gonna be okay, looking like it's a good thing, and yet it's like leprosy. It's rotting you from the inside. It's Zerah, and the battle is at Marishah, because Marishah was meaning a dominion or headship. It was a strategic town, city, place in Judah, and the enemy always comes in at Marisha. It always comes in at the head. It always comes in at the most strategic point to get you where if you fall there, then it ruins everything else. The enemy attacks both when we are making mistakes, but sometimes when we're pursuing God. We gotta be fully committed to build everything on God. The second thing I want you to write down is this. Be fully committed to seek God with all of your heart. Be fully committed to seek God with all of your heart. Second Chronicles 15, let's jump over. So now he's fought that battle, he's won, and now they're rejoicing, now they're believing. We're still following God, fully committed. Verse two, and he went out to meet King Asa, this is a prophet, and he was returning from the battle. Listen to me, Asa, again the prophet speaking for the Lord. He shall listen all you people of Judah and Benjamin. The Lord will stay with you as long as you stay with him. Powerful. When you seek him, you will find him. But if you abandon him, he will abandon you. For a long time, Israel was without a true God, without a priest to teach them, and without the law to instruct them. But whenever they were in trouble and turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him out, they found him. That's so good. I love, in verse three, it says this. I circled it several times this week. I just, 
I believe this is the moment for somebody. I don't know if it's at Winter Park, at Oviedo, at Sanford, at Winter Springs, but I believe the Holy Spirit brought this word for you today. Maybe this whole service we had was just for you. Here it is, verse three. For a long time, Israel, put yourself in that place. Israel is the people of God. For a long time, you were without a true God, without a priest to teach you, and without a law, the word of God, to instruct you. I don't know why you're by yourself for a long time. Maybe you've never been to a church. Maybe you've never heard the life-changing message of Jesus Christ, this gospel that Jesus gave you what you did not deserve and called it grace, that he lived a perfect life, died a sinner's death in your place, rose again three days later to give you victory over death. Maybe you've never heard, but for a long time, you've been without God. For a long time, you've been without somebody to follow. For a long time, you've been without a book of instruction to build your life on. For a long time, maybe you've been to church like me when I was growing up, and for a long time, I dabbled in Christianity, but I said, God, I need you, and then I abandon you, and I need you, and then I abandon you. And what I need to tell you what he did for me at 19 is the same thing he can do for you. It's the same thing he did for the people of Judah and Benjamin here. For a long time, they're without God, but the minute, the moment that they came back to him, it says God is right there. He's waiting, and when we come and when we seek, he welcomes us with open arms. Verse four, but whenever they were in trouble, is anybody in trouble today? Is anybody lost today? Is anybody searching today? I don't have any answer. But whenever they were in trouble and turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him out, they found him. I promise you, he's not hiding today. He's one step away. He's one decision away from changing everything. We're writing a story, all of us, but Jesus wants to write a much better story. In fact, the page is already written. God's not in time. I feel like this is, this is the picture I got this week. He's got the next Two or three pages of your journey. He's got them like right here. Like you're sitting across and you don't even see him yet. And he's just writing and he's writing. You're over here copying and pasting and editing and deleting and moving and ripping. And oh my gosh, what did I do? And you're throwing it out. And he's just saying, if you'll just put that mess down, I'm already writing a much better story. Let me show you. But whenever they turned to him, he met them there. They found him. And everything changed. And here's the covenant he brought them into. Let's look in verse 15, then let's move on. Or chapter 15, verse 12, rather. They entered into a covenant. You can do that today. At the end of our service today, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to enter into a covenant, a relationship with Jesus. They enter into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, with all of their hearts and soul. We get there. And I believe today that everybody at our locations is leaving here with a relationship with Jesus. I'm just crazy enough to believe that he loves all of us so much that if, if you will open up your heart to him, we can all leave here differently in Jesus' name. But we're gonna run. And we get weary and we get tired and we get distracted. Man, I was feeling so good at mile 19. So at mile 19, I decided that I was, I was ready. That wall they had talked about, they were stupid. I could see the finish line. I'm two-thirds there. I'm ready. I'm ready to celebrate. Where's my medal? Where's my phone? I got some text to send. <laughs> got some bragging to do. I will let you know the story ended four hours and 16 minutes, 20 minutes ahead of anybody else at the table. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I got arrogant. I got prideful. and I got humbled. So what happens to Asa. Asa, we find him faithful in chapter 15, verse 12. Chapter 15, verse 17, he's faithful, he's faithful, he's faithful. He remained faithful. I believe Asa is in heaven. The Bible's really clear. Rehoboam was an evil king. Asa remained faithful to the end, heart and soul. I'm not questioning where he's spending eternity. What I'm asking is, could he have finished the race better? It's because he gets another fight in chapter 16. And here's what happens. He's running another race. And, and what he does is he goes not to the Lord, but to the treasuries in the temple. So he's having this, this invasion from this king. And instead of going to God and saying, God, help me again. God, you're the God that helped me against Zerah. You're the God that helped me against Libya. You're the God that helped me. He goes to the treasuries of the temple and he negotiates with another king to break his treaty 
paying him off with the winnings from a former victory of God and saying, I'm gonna rely on what God did and my own strategy now. Asa was living off the leftovers. How many of you all vacations love leftovers? Unless it's Thanksgiving, I got no time for leftovers. Thanksgiving leftovers, come on somebody. Those casseroles are better after day. Put those back in the fridge, reheat those things. I will eat Thanksgiving for a few days. Come on somebody, anybody excited? Man, Thanksgiving is awesome. I'm preparing right now. You know what I mean? Like I'm just, stra- I'm, I'm eating a little bit more. I'm carving up, I'm getting ready. You can't just show, you can't run a marathon without training. You can't have a good Thanksgiving without training. You gotta get ready. I'm fully committed to Thanksgiving this year. I thought that was funnier too. <laughs> I'm gonna have to cut some stuff for 1130. <laughs> Leftovers. I don't like them. They have a weird consistency sometimes. They're like, oh, that tasted different last night. It's mushy. They're like, oh, well, you should put it in the oven. If I was gonna put it in the oven, I would just cook something new. No, it's a leftover. I'm throwing it in the microwave. I'm gonna eat it in 30 seconds. That's the point. Too many of us, church, are living off the leftovers. Asa didn't turn to idols. Asa didn't turn his back on God. Asa, what he did is he just went back to something God did before, and instead of trusting in the provider, he trusted in the provision. Let's go back to verse 8 and 9 in chapter 16. Let's read together and then bring it to life. Don't you remember... That's the third point. Write this down before I forget. Be fully committed to remember all God has done. It's important, but we gotta remember the right thing, not the wrong thing. All that God has done. Don't you remember what happened to the Ethiopians and the Libyans and their vast army with all the chariots and charioteers? At the time you did what? You relied on the Lord and he handed them over to you. The eyes of the Lord searched the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him What a fool you have been. From now on, you will be at war. We know the next six years of his life, he was at war. He died in his 41st year of his reign with a foot disease. Asa's name means healer, and he died of a foot disease. Some irony in there. Remember and rely. Remember what God has done. Rely on his power and his prominence and his leading. I wrote this down this week. Remember and rely. But don't rely on the remembering. What I mean by that is this. Don't rely on that you're just gonna remember what God has done because Asa had a new test and a new attack and a new challenge. And he relied on the provision of yesterday. Again, it wasn't evil. It just wasn't for now. He said, look what God has done. He was living off the leftovers. And hey, Christians, hey, Action Church, if we're not careful, this will be our story. If you're new with us, we are the second fastest growing church in America, 2018. And every time I travel and every time I talk to pastors and talk to people in our community, they say this, get this, said this at the 18 party. They say, hey, enjoy this season because churches like yours have seasons. That's gotta be the most offensive thing I've ever heard. If heaven and hell are reality, how can church growth and reaching connecting people be a season? You know how? When we live off the leftovers. Man, I love that meal. Man, can we, can we eat that again? There's two options. You can go through the work of cooking it again. You can go buy the ingredients. You can look for better ingredients, higher quality. You can keep making that dish better. Or you can just keep reheating that thing week after week, month after month. That's nasty. The thing is growing stuff. It's growing mold and it's old and it's ugly. And yet, no, it's just, it was so good. You, you weren't there. You gotta, I remember how good it used to be. Why do we get stuck in remembering what God provided? He's not saying look back at what I did. He's saying look back at who I was and who I am. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if I got you through the battle of Ethiopia and the battle of Libya, why did you not rely on me now, Action Church? We cannot remember and relax. We gotta remember and rely and continue to reach people 
Man, I remember what we did last year. Remember, we raised over a million dollars in a day to move into this facility. You remember that? That was awesome, amazing. Remember what God did, but don't remember, relax. Remember and reach for more. There's more locations and more people. I can remember and relax. I remember what we did last year, hundreds, 500 plus Thanksgiving meals provided to people that need them. Remember that? That was really cool. Awesome. Don't get stuck in the memory. Let the memory motivate you to do more. Yeah. Pastor Evan, our Winter Springs location, one time in a staff huddle said, at Action Church, we don't reach and relax. We reach and connect. And we're not going to reach out and then relax and rely on what God did, what's in the temple, what's in the treasury. No, 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 we are going to reach and rely on Jesus and reach and rely on Jesus and then get a little crazier and reach a little bit more and rely on Jesus, both in our giving and our serving. Hey, here's a practical one for all of us. Maybe you're not there yet. Maybe you're not ready to give God and trust God with your finances. Maybe you're not ready to serve with your time. We're going to do a fast the 1st of January, just a few days. We're going to give up some things that we love for something we love even more. What if you just said, God, I'm going to believe you for more this year. Thank you so much for 2018. Thank you so much for what you've done in my family. Thank you so much for what you provided for me. But this year, I'm going to lay something down that I love because I'm reaching out for more. I'm not going to rest in what you've done. I'm going to be grateful, but I'm going to look ahead at the story that you're writing for me. And we trust God more. We focus less on rewriting our past. Jesus already paid for that, and we look ahead. So many of us never get to what's next in our race because we're too busy trying to fix the past that he already died and paid for. So here's where I want to leave us. This picture. Church, Action Church, all of our locations. Do you look like me at the finish line of the race in Nashville? Just barely making it. Just barely one step in front of the other. Painful, hurting, people having to carry me because I'm so broken. Or could we remember and be fully committed on all that God has done? Can we be fully committed on building and fully committed on seeking that we're not limping across the finish line, but we are in full stride. We're getting stronger as the finish comes. We're encouraging others, and we're running the race in such a way that, like, no, I want to run like that. I want to be like that. I want to reach and connect like that. Are we running in full stride into the destiny that God has for us? God can rewrite your story. He can help you finish well, but you've got to let him, let him be in control. If you believe that today, Winter Park, Winter Springs, Oviedo, Stamp. Come on, give God your best this morning. Thank him for his word. God, we love you. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that's living and active, that we can study a passage written and lived out thousands and thousands of years ago, that it applies right to our situation today. Church, every head bowed, every eye closed at all of our locations. Nobody looking around. Just a moment with you and God. For a long time, a long time you've been on your own. For a long time, you've struggled. For a long time, you've just been barely putting one foot in front of the other. For a long time, you've been writing your own story. What if today you turned it all around? Not on your own, but you turned it around by turning over control to Jesus. Today is your day of salvation. Today is the day that you recommit your life and give God complete control. What if you did that? Exchanged your debt for God's grace. Jesus already paid for it. Give it to him right now. The Bible's real clear in the book of Romans. If we'll confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that he is Lord, everything changes when we, we simply surrender. What if you did that today here at Winter Park, at Winter Springs, Oviedo, or Sanford? Maybe watching online, you said, Pastor Justin, today is my day. For the first time ever, I'm making a decision to follow Jesus. Or maybe for the first time in a long time, I'm recommitting my life to him. If that's you, raise your hand right where you are. Say, I want a relationship with Jesus. I'm giving God the pen. I'm giving God control. I got one, two, three here, four, five, six, seven up top, eight over here on the left. Proud of you. Nine, 10, 11. Come on, Winter Springs, Oviedo, Sanford. Raise them high. Come on, God is moving right now. Holy Spirit, speak to people. Anybody else before we pray? Proud of you. And put your hands down. Praise in your heart as I pray it out loud. Say this. Say, God, I love you. And God, I thank you for saving me. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. And I'm saved only by your grace. I'm confessing with my mouth and I'm believing in my heart that you are the Lord. And I'm giving you that place today. Complete and total control. God, have your way in my life. Thank you. Thank you for saving me. Now, God, I pray for all of us. I pray we'll be a church that's fully committed 
fully committed to building on you, fully committed to seeking you, and fully committed to remembering you, relying on you, the provider, and trusting you for future provision. In Jesus' name. We love you. We praise you for what you've done. In Jesus' name. Amen. Church, can we celebrate all the decisions that were just made? Come on, really celebrate them.